All right, um, this chapter is not the best. Okay, none of them are the best, but um, <laughs> we're going to go through it anyway. Um, very soon, probably in about two weeks, I'll be adding a couple Metasploit labs up there. So that'll, that'll be something different for you. So, Okay, Windows vulnerabilities. I like how they say here, many OSs have serious vulnerabilities. Okay, they've all had vulnerabilities. But it's not just Windows, it's everybody. It's Mac, it's Apple, it's everybody. And Linux, it's, they all do. I would probably say that Windows might have more because more people use it. Okay, it makes sense. Okay, there's more of it out there. Okay. Now, they do mention how we must disable, reconfigure, and uninstall services. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. But that's one of the biggest changes in Windows. Initially, Windows would have everything enabled. Now, everything's disabled. Okay. Um, 10A says most services are disabled by default, which is a good thing, but it sucks. You have to figure out how to turn them on. Okay. There's a common vulnerabilities with it. They give you a link here, which actually has a, and there's actually one on Rapid7 as well. I've seen that website. Yeah. Well, I've seen that website. Yeah. And it, and it shows you a lot of vulnerabilities out there. And if you wanted to, you can go look and see what's out there. See, you know, what problems are up with your OSs. See what, you know, actually, let's go look at one. I think the latest is under Rapid7. CVE. I think you believe it will show us a link to one. That's the one they have there, then. Okay. The Rapid7 has a very popular one. Let's do uh, Internet Explorer. Should be able to find one. Yeah, look at all the vulnerabilities with Internet Explorer. So it's kind of a cool thing. You can go in and put in like certain versions. I'm running this application in this version. It will tell you if there's a vulnerability in that edition. So, yeah. Now let's see. Rapid 7. Rapid 7 bought out Metasploit. You can also, if I remember right, there should be a place on here to look for vulnerabilities. I'm sure they, they have one somewhere. But, okay. But it's a good thing to look for that. Now, most of us aren't going to do anything with that. But if you're an admin or something, it's probably a good idea to check this stuff frequently. Okay. So as many are listed there, some are very complex. And just because they're complex doesn't mean someone will not exploit them. Okay. It says you can use the information to test your computer. And, you know, I said we're going to put a, a project for you guys using Metasploit. They don't really talk about it here. But you're going to be using that to actually exploit some vulnerabilities. So that will be kind of fun. All right. Um, File system. We all know what a file system is. This is where we store files. It's a store and manage files, store people, what people create. And now with you know nowadays, what I, another aspect of that is cloud storage. That's a real big now, you know, big thing nowadays. So. Okay, Microsoft started out with FAT. Some of you remember FAT. Then they became FAT16, and then FAT32. It stands for File Allocation Table. It was how stuff was stored. And even today, I mean, you make a a USB drive, the default file format is FAT. Even though you would think they'd be NTFS now or something, but they're not. Windows, Windows 10 usually defaults NTFS. Does it now? If you take, well, even with the flash drive though? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a change, and I haven't seen that. No, well, it depends because like like kind of, there's limitations on FAT, like four gigabytes at, right. at, at a time. And size, so, yes. Good yeah, point. so a lot of them are going to be SD4 now. If they're bigger. <coughs> okay. But file systems, that's kind of a big issue, and they talk something here that's important is ACLs, access control list. It's kind of the permissions of the ability to access files. And a lot of these exploits allow you to get around those permissions. You actually can, you know, become root or whatever. Okay. NTFS is their new technology file system. It's kind of funny, but they've actually been running NTFS since was it mid nineties? Is that right? Does anyone remember when NTFS came out? They're still calling it new technologies. Came out with NT4. NT4, there you go. Okay, yeah. It was right around mid 90s somewhere. And it's like, why are they still calling it new technology? But I don't know. But they still are. Okay. There's also something called file streams, which we'll be doing a project with that. It, uh, file streams actually came about because a Mac. Mac has resource forts on files. And you can actually hide stuff in alternate data streams. You'll be doing a project using that. Okay. RPC, remote procedures call, says it allows a program running on one host to run code on another. Okay. 
if you think about it, a lot of our administration is done remotely, so they really need RPCs to done, do that kind of stuff, okay? There's worms that exploit it. There's all kinds of problems with it. Now, they mentioned something in here called baseline security analyzer, and I'll tell you, it was on the desk when I took it. I don't like the tool. I think it's kind of outdated, but it's kind of one of those that everybody knows about, okay? You run it, and it tells you if you're vulnerable based on specific issues, okay? NIPAO is a real old way of communicating, basically. It says a software loaded in the memory and enables computers to interact with the network. It's still there. It's still being used, although not as much as it was. We're pretty much doing it all over TCP IP now. Okay. And they mentioned that down here at the bottom. Okay. So net, you know, NBT is net BIOS over TCP is what we're really do nowadays. Ah, yes, you would. Yeah. yeah. All right, so systems running Windows OS is share files and resources using NetBIOS. Still backwards compatible. So it's going to be around for a while. I just, it's not as much as it used to be. SMB is a, basically the same thing. Used to share files. It works with, you know, NetBIOS, NetBuoy, TCP IP. It also gives you the ability to connect into um, Linux systems to basically from Linux into Windows to make it simulate a Windows machine. And Mac does the same thing as well. It took them seven years to patch a vulnerability in it. It was a crazy amount of time it took. SMB2 came out in Vista. Windows 7 has it as well. Okay. All right. Uh, CIFS, Common Internet File System. It's just a new protocol. They still have SMB. SMB is not used much, which is, I mean, it's still there. It's, I know my Apple device. I think it, my latest version actually has CIFS on it, and I think it disabled SMB. I had to turn it on. Does anyone remember? I think the newer ones, they actually no longer support it by default. You've got to enable the feature. Okay. It's a remote file system protocol. It's just a newer way of doing it. Okay. Um, it has locking capabilities, read ahead, right behind, fault tolerance. It's kind of like what NTFS gave us over FAT. This is giving us over... That bias. So that's that So just gives us a lot more security in the area. You don't need to know that much about it. Okay. It says attackers look for service designated domain controllers. And then they, you know, obviously a bigger machine has more stuff on it. And they normally have what's called a cool catalog server. And that's where a lot of resources are shared and they can find out permissions and objects and all that on your system. Null sessions is an anonymous connection. There's a lot of times it's used with RPC, remote procedures called. It's used to display information about users, about policies. So a lot of, you'll see that quite often. I think, hold on. I think, is it NBT stat? I can see that. Dash A, I think, come on. What is it? What is it? Can't take it without the specifying it. Do you need to specify the, the argument after the A? Yeah, I should. Yeah, but there's a way to do it without specifying it. Is it? No, that's not going to be three. I can't. There's one. Let me try a. You should be able to see. I can't remember the exact command. It's been a while since I've done it. Let's try it with my remote machine here. Ah. <clears throat> yeah, that's not what I want to see. That's not what I was looking for. All right. But you can see null sessions. I can't remember the darn what to use to view that. But it was MBT set. That's what I was using, wasn't it? Hold on. There it is, it's NetStats, the one I wanted. You should be able to see all the connections into our machine right here. So what do you think the second one down is? Anybody? It says Microsoft DS was probably a domain control or component of one aspect or another. Don't know, but all the, uh, there's our Zoom connection. You can see all, we have a lot of Zoom connections going on. At one point, this would show null sessions. That's what I wanted to see. This 
Is there a way to display null sessions? Let's try with dash A. This even shows the listening close. I can't remember exactly which way, but there is a way in here to see the null sessions that are there as well. Okay. Um, web services, you know, I've used, has anyone ever used IIS Lockdown Wizard? I ran a ISP for years and I hated that tool. Okay. It was originally older versions of IIS, but it made it so difficult to get anything done. And let me, let me tell you a quick story of what I had. I got, um, Microsoft Server 2004. I know some of you might have played with that version years ago. I bought it through Dell. I bought brand new servers, pre-installed with it. They shipped it to me and it had issues with it. Well, the first issue was, I think it was 2004 was the first version where everything was turned off. Prior to that, when everything was turned on. So none of my stuff was working because they, they literally switched to the model of turning everything off. So I had to figure out how to turn it all back on. But I also had an issue with name-based hosting. It's called host header and IP-based hosting. It supports both of those. And in both at the same time, yet there was an issue with it where it didn't work correctly. So I contacted Microsoft, and they originally thought I pirated their software because the version of server that I was running was newer. The date was newer than it should have been. It's because it was pre-installed by Dell. But I went through a big issue with that. But uh, I tell you, they were probably in my machine for three months remotely, nonstop, trying to fix my issue. Because I was hosting via a name, like rose.edu. And I was hosting via IP addresses. And I was hosting some by both, which is totally legit. You can do that. And their software supports it. So I was doing it. But it didn't work. So I called Microsoft, and they're like, but why are you doing it? I'm like, because I can. You support it, and I have a need for it. Well, no one else does. Well, well why is it in your software? They just didn't have it working correctly. So they were in it for about three months, and they finally made a hot fix just for me to fix the error. I'm assuming they rolled it over in later service packs. But, but it's crazy. But now they have, like I said, IS6, they come out with secure by default, which – if you don't know what you're doing, it makes it very hard because everything is disabled. I mean, you think Active Server Pages, which is Microsoft's own language, would be turned on at least. It's not. Everything is turned off. So. You have no, Active Server Pages, ASP, yeah. that was even turned off. And I'm running these servers and I have to figure out how to turn all that crap back on. I'm like, what the heck? So, I mean, it's, it was, I know why they did it. I'm glad they did it, but it was very eye open when it was literally everything was turned on by default. So now everything turned off. <coughs> okay. They talk about keeping your system patched. Very important. You should update it quite frequently, but not immediately. You should always test things first. Okay. All right. So it's configure only needed services and applications. If you don't need them, you shouldn't have them on it. You'll notice like Telnet, those of you in friends that did a project with Telnet, Telnet is no longer installed as a feature. You've got to enable the feature. So I was really surprised no one contacted me. He said, hey, tell them that's missing off my machine this time. I was really expecting that call. And I never got oh, it. Yes. On Cali. In Cali, it's there. On Cali, it's there by default, but Windows, it's not. Right. On most, I don't think any of us were running Windows. Okay. Because I knew, because there's normally somebody running in Windows. So I was waiting for the call. Tell them that's not here. But no, never got it. Okay. Microsoft SQL Server. That was a vulnerability a long time ago where basically, like I said, it had a no password for the systems account, and it was blank, basically, and people could get in. It was just a really big issue. Right. That's been six years ago. Buffer overflow. I was going to try to do a project in there. Let me explain what a buffer overflow is. So if we all take in one language or another at some point in your life, okay. you know what, like an array is or a list or something. Okay. So in a list or an array holds a certain amount of items. Say it holds 10 items. What happens when you try to access item number 11? It doesn't exist. So it basically, no, actually in Java and Python and all them, it's like, eh, doesn't exist. Well, languages like C and C++, what they do is imagine if each element was four bytes. So if you had 10 elements, you would have 40 bytes. So if you just try to access number 11, it would actually go the next four bytes. So you're actually reading 
whatever is in memory. So C and C++ could do that. And that's why, you know, so there's a really big issue. Okay, they have no protection against that. So that's why they're not as popular anymore. For programmers, you have to really know what you're doing because at least in Java, you screw up and, you know, make an array out of bounds there. Like, oh, I screwed up. But in C, it's just going to function just fine, and you'll never realize it until you're, who knows what you're accessing. So that's really what a buffer local flow is. Okay. Passwords, it says, passwords is authorized users on the weakest security link, most difficult to secure. Obviously, I have an issue with passwords tonight. Okay. Relies on people, and we all hate passwords. Okay. And I don't, you know, what was it, a couple of years ago, some company said they'll be gone by 2020. So some passwords? big company, yeah, they're still going to be gone. Yeah, I have one, I have one yeah. UBKeys, and now they're, that's spreading out. Like Google is now allowing UBKeys. Uh, Facebook is using it, Apple is using YubiKey. Right. Also, what exactly is YubiKey? It's a, it's a, it's a USB. It's a token, like a RSA token or something? Yeah. It's a, one, it's a one-time token. Okay, one-time token. Okay, yeah. yeah. It's like, it's like, a, um, in, remember those um, RSA? Uh, yeah, RSA. Have the the codes, are, right. Yeah, it's like that, it's just you don't have to manually type it in anymore. You just plug oh. it in. Oh, it's like my Gmail account. I have two-factor turned on. Whenever yeah. I try to log in, it says, pops up on my run. You try to log in? I say yes. Yeah, Same. you can do three-factor now. It's so something you are, something you have, and something you know. Uh, so, so, I mean, I'm glad they're doing it. But, you know, and it says the bottom one, a comprehensive password policy is critical. Uh, Ed was having a problem this week. He couldn't log in, and his password was expiring. And he went to change it, and it wouldn't let him change it because... It didn't, didn't tell why. It just says you can't use that. It says, I always use the same password. I just changed the last digit to whatever, and then I recycled them, and I'm like, not really a good idea. But a lot of people do that. They'll have whatever your password is to put a one at the end, or a two, or a three, you know, stuff like that. So. All right. Um, it says, comprehensive policy should be changed regularly. Now, I was in Vegas at a conference, and there was some lady speaking, a real big wig, on social media. And she says one of the problems is we change our passwords too frequently. So if you have a good password, but if you're forced to change it too frequently, you get lazy. Yeah, I know. Like, I'm so tired of this, and I'm just going to go with whatever, your dog's name or something. So she actually did a bunch of research that proved that, you know, changing it every whatever is too short. I forget the exact time period she gave me. So many places do. Every time I log into the military website, I have to change my password every time. And then they write it down and stick on post Yeah. Stuff. Okay. Does it require at least eight characters? I don't think that's really helpful because at least the way Windows stores it actually stores it in seven character chunks. So really, an eight character password is a seven and a one. The one's going to break instantly. If you ever use uh, Lovecraft or uh, you'll actually be doing when you do the Metasploit Lab. You'll actually see it'll break the last digit of an eight character password instantly. This is a one character you, password. You really need at least fifteen. Yeah, it's I mean, because eight is worthless. It's like is it better than seven? Well, it's not much better because it's really just a seven and a one. So fifteen is good, and a lot of places are requiring twelve now, some are requiring fourteen now. It breaks the password into seven character chunks and yes. hashes each chunk. Yes, it does. Oh, okay. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. and you will see that in the Metasploit project we're going to do. For really, your maximum security, you want twenty-one characters. So that yeah. breaks up. I usually like thirty. Yeah. But, and, but you know, I have to use LastPass to do that because you can't remember those things. Yeah. Well, I mean, on your LastPass, everybody for LastPass, has, like I have like a, a twenty-nine. Yeah. Character, you know, it's a phrase. Right. Which is that? Like, yeah. You only want to have to type that once a day. Right. You know, so exactly. All right, um, it says require complex passwords. Don't use dictionary words. Um, you know, I teach for OSU, and their system, you know, I use LastPass, a 30-character password. But it will actually go through your password. If it has any part of a dictionary word or any part of your name or any part of whatever, and it's like, not good. I'm like, what? Then I look at, oh, it's got the word, you know, and in the middle of it or something. It's, it's tough sometimes to get those. Um, must not be identified with a user. Okay, never write it down. Do not reveal it to anyone. But I will tell you, they don't put it here. 
you really need a password management service. If you don't have one, you need one. Because you can't remember this stuff anymore, unless your password is up. And if you're going to use a password manager, you better use two-factor authentication because yes. that they got everything. It's two or three, yes. Trapcom gave us passwords. We couldn't make up our own. Yeah, I, you know, the funny thing is, when I was in the military, we used CAMS, Core Automated Maintenance System, and they hard-coded a password for you. And you had to enter it 8,000 times a day. So I still know those passwords. XAN180MA was my password for the longest time because I literally had to enter it hundreds of times a day. And the really secure one, you should even know. You should have LastPass generate it for you right. so that you don't even know your Right, password, exactly. You know what I mean? That's what I do. I have it generate for me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, <clears throat> okay. Configure dom domain controllers to password age. In other words, make sure your passwords expire. The length, complexity, all that stuff. You can configure all that on there. And a lot of, like a, here at Rose State, we're getting ready. We actually went out on bids for a single sign-on solution. So very soon that will be implemented here at Rose State. So we're hoping... Which one are you using, Ken? I, I don't know who they're going to the final, the final results. But I mean, your all's accounts were hard-coded to your birthday. Were they not initially? Still are. <laughs> Still are. Now, actually, we rolled out a new version this weekend. It literally came online Monday. Oh, that must be why the Wi-Fi kicked all my saved um, devices off. Ah, it might have. I have to sign it. I just okay. But yeah, Monday, Oasis is totally here. Let, let me show you what it is now, just so you can see. Yeah, okay, Oasis is fine. Yes, they updated it. I tried to get on the phone 20 minutes ago. How do you change your password? I have no idea. There's a place in here to do it. Oh. But see, that's the new Oasis. That's new, yeah. Yeah, it's totally new. That's new. Because I walked in Monday morning, I'm like, whoa, and I was trying to do an advisement for a student. It would not work. So I go, oh, like, oh, yeah, that part don't work. I'm like, great. <laughs> then they had an email today. They fixed it. I'm like, okay, good. I needed that. Okay. But uh, we are going to something, and it might be involved, incorporated with this. I've been gone for the last couple of weeks. You are not authorized for this day. Okay. Um, <laughs> still saying not. Well, try back to your birthday. Maybe you that's, that's Yeah, that's right. Well, then maybe you need to go to the Rose website, the main, and look at the bottom. They might have changed the way you log into it now. Okay. Right at the very bottom, at the very bottom of the front page, it tells you how to log into the app. And so the system is down. Oh, great. Yeah, <laughs> so obviously there's an issue with the new system. <laughs> so I guess they were all here all weekend. They said it worked great. Obviously. It's working well, great. I'm trying to use the app, so. No, it's Nice. I went to the app and then I went to the actual website. Oh, okay. So, I'm just saying, um, to lockout thresholds, you know, I've had an issue with my password ever since December time period. My password expired, so I changed it. And literally since that day, I'd be getting locked out at least once every day. At least. I go to log in, and like, okay, if you know how Exchange works inside of Windows, if you log into Windows, you have Exchange or Outlook installed that it uses the same credentials. Mine still pops up and asks for a password. It, is, it shouldn't be. So I reported it so many times, and it turns out it's not me. There's a lot of people. So there's something going on. Maybe they're implementing this new system that's sucking. I, I don't know what it is. I really do. But, yeah, I came in yesterday and showed up to lock me out again. I'm like, serious? Virginia, last Tuesday, tried to get into my computer. I was locked out. I'm like, obviously, I haven't been trying to get in, so it hasn't been me. But I don't know what's going on. But threshold and duration kind of important. The threshold is how many times can they screw up before it locks them out. Duration is once they screw it up, how long are they locked out? But ours is set to 15 minutes. So I just wait 15 minutes sometimes. Sometimes I go to teach a class and I'm locked out. So, all right. So as many tools are available to help with this stuff, okay? And we're going to start talking about some of these. Nessus is probably the most popular out of that list. OpenVAS is big as well. Um, yeah, Nessus for a little, they wanted to charge, but now you can you can get one free account. If you've never played it, it's kind of a cool tool. This is Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer. Again, I'm not a fan of it, but it does work. Checks patches, security updates. It really checks to see if your machine's up there. You know, and whenever you use a program called TeamViewer, so for remote access. Yeah. Okay. Well, I use TeamViewer, and it's funny because 
even that application when I'm remotely connecting in, it'll even tell me if the remote machine has all the updates installed and all that other stuff. So it is kind of cool that a lot of programs are starting to do that. Okay, and here's the Microsoft baseline. The problem with this is, at least in the past, I haven't used it lately. In the past, you could scan your machine and tell it to fix them. And that was the issue. So I don't know if it still does that, but it, you know, there's lots of different things to check. Okay, and it just, you know, I said I ran an, an ISP, and when it would go in there and adjust your IIS settings for you, suck because then it's like, well, this page don't work and whatever. So uh, it just sucked. Okay, we checked SQL, just checked a whole bunch of stuff. It says the system must meet. Before you can use it, after you install, you must scan cell, cell, scan other computers, and scan remotely. So, okay. So again, I'm not a fan of it, but it does work, and I know it's listed on the exam. So, so it's going to be on your home market, guarantee you. Okay. Here's the best practices: penetration tester finds and reports vulnerabilities. Okay. Security tester finds vulnerabilities, gives recommendations for correcting them. I've done that a lot. I've had a lot of companies call me to come out and look for, you know, scan their systems for vulnerabilities. I normally use tools like there's a tool out there called LandGuard, L-A-N-G-U-A-R-D by GFI, which is really a pretty good tool. That's the commercial one I used to use because that one would actually scan the network. And then as long as you have the admin account, the domain password, you can scan and update remotely. So you can literally be sitting there, scan the network, and say, okay, update this one, and update this one, and there's an all from that same machine, you have to, which was kind of a nice feature. Okay. Patching them, keep them up to date. Said so we already saw where we can find CVEs quite easily, so it's helpful if you keep them up to date. Okay. It says access windows updates manually, and I think mine's actually turned off. I need to go check it again. I don't know why, but Pro State with Windows 10 does not do automatic updates. I don't know why. Okay. I got to go fix mine again. Okay. Over large networks, SMS, that's what we use here. I'm assuming some of you probably have seen SMS, but it really, it queries your system. It queries the software you got installed. It does a very good job. Okay. Then there's WSUS, Windows Software Update Service. We do run that here at Rose, but I don't think we're running for Windows 10. Okay. Then the System Center Configuration Manager is available as well. And a virus. Y'all have antivirus? Y'all use the one that comes with Windows probably? It's actually a decent one. Yeah. Years ago, it was actually a software program called Giant. Giant Antivirus was like number one, number one rated. I actually owned a copy. I bought it because I, you know, I ran a company. Then Microsoft bought them out. Now it's free. That's what became, um, what was it called? Windows. Defender. Defender. For that. Microsoft Security Essentials. Was it called Security Essentials or something like that? It was something before Defender. And now it became Windows Defender. Okay. I don't recommend using programs like Avast. They're free. They work good. But they're going to keep prompting you that, hey, you need to update your stuff. I mean, no, not update your stuff. They want you to keep recommend the pro version to you. So. Yeah, I used Komodo on Linux. It was wonderful. And Mac. Trojan. <laughs> like, no, that's not a Trojan. I know that's not a Trojan. They would be really loud at me at like 3 a.m. Oh. I didn't have that problem. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. super intrusive for my, for my experience. Uh, I also use Clam. Y'all heard of Clam? Clam antivirus, that's a really good one for Linux systems as well. So, there, so that, that was another good one. But there's lots out there. Uh, Microsoft Baseline, uh, not um, Malwarebytes. Somebody has to use Malwarebytes. Okay, Malwarebytes is, is I amazing. You don't like it? I, I said I know about it. Oh, okay. Um, Rosane even uses it. We just don't buy it. So we all have the free version on our machines. And they pop up every few days. Hey, you want to buy this? No. Okay. All right, enable logging. Okay. With my password issue, I've asked so many times, please turn on auditing in my account so I can find out which device is logging in incorrectly. I must have told them at least a dozen times. I still do not have the results. We'll get back with you. There's something logging in remotely. I mean, I've literally removed it from my MacBook. I've removed it from my iPad. 
It's on my desktop and my iPhone. It's the only thing my password's on. And I'm still getting locked out. And if you know anything about your phone, it saves it on there. So you don't even have to enter it. So what's doing it wrong? I don't know. But logging kind of a big deal. And they also talk about, you know, traffic patterns. They, t they don't really mention here, but you really need to set up a baseline, you know, what you're expecting traffic to be, and then look for an anomalies in that, okay? Possible breaches, stuff like that, okay? Signs of intrusion, you know, all that kind of stuff. Disable unneeded services, kind of a big deal. But, uh, you know, here's what I do a lot. Like, if I get a machine that's doing weird stuff, I'll go in here under processes and I'll see what the heck is running. And a lot of times if I just cannot figure it out, I'll just randomly pick processes. If I don't know what they are, if I've never seen them before, I'll click on them and stop them. What's the worst that's going to happen? You have to restart your computer. Machine reboots. That's about it. Uh, right, you also assign an open file location from that. Yep, you can't change. Yep. It's like, if it's something you don't recognize and it's in a folder you've never heard of. And there's also a program called Process Explorer which is kind of like this on steroids. A little snitch, dude. A little is good, too, yes. Yeah. A little snitch is great for when you're tired. Nice. You can block it. Oh, yeah. But, you know, disable stuff you don't need. You know, and, and, you just, and it's one of those things you need to check frequently. <laughs> Delete unnecessary applications and scripts. You know, reducing. It says... Only open what needs to be open and close everything else, and only open things you know where they came from. Filter out unnecessary ports, but again, for that you need a firewall. Okay. Um, let's see. It says minimize the number of administrative users. Uh, implement software. You know, we talked about that. Network segmentation. You know, divide your network up if you can. Delete unused scripts. Delete hidden shares. Delete. You know, default shares, enable password, but we talked about a lot of this stuff already. Be careful with the default permissions. You know, what I've actually seen lately is a lot of devices like home routers, now they're requiring you to change the password before you can use them. For the longest time, you could just leave it set at password. But or now you can... Add, it used to be for uh, Netgear, it was a link. And then add, yeah, and then but now that. most of them are, first time you bring it up, it's like, you must change the password now. Or they hard code it with something like LRPD. Yeah, and I've also seen a lot of them, the username and password, the first half of your MAC address is the username. The last half is the password. I hate that. That sucks. I mean, because then you got to find out what the MAC address is. But, I mean, it's decent. Because someone has to be on your local network to get it. Okay. Use file integrity checkers. Disable guest accounts. So, you know, just a lot of good practices here. Use group policies. Um, let's see. Develop a comprehensive security awareness program. Keep an eye on emerging threats. Get all normal stuff there. Linux. There are vulnerabilities in Linux as well, just not as many, it seems. Keep current. A lot of them, like, you know, you can get the rolling updates, so they automatically update. Not update it yourself with, you know, app get. Okay, it says run control service configurations, learn basic commands, and if you have taken our Linux class, you should know plenty at this point. Okay. Samba is what they use to simulate connecting into Windows. So many companies have a mix of our Windows. It allows it to trick Windows into thinking Linux is Windows. That's really what Samba is for. Okay. All right. There's CVEs for those as well. And OpenVAS is probably the biggest tool for that. There's an example of OpenVAS. There's more of it. Just walking you through it. Check for Trojan program again. Uh, something like malware bytes is good for that. Your antivirus is good for that. They can steal your passwords. They can do keystroke logging. They can do remote administration stuff. They can do all kinds of stuff. Okay. And once you do the Metasploit Lab, you'll actually see an example of what happens if you don't do some of the stuff we're talking about. Okay. They can you know, ramp somewhere. They can encrypt your files, and you're never going to get them back unless you uh, pay for the them. MindTap Labs used. Metasploit with the, to install remote access code. Oh, wait, you did it? You actually yeah. did it? Yeah, with, with Metasploit. Sweet. Okay, well, you're going to do it again then. Awesome. I didn't know you did the, So, what did you do in that lab? Um, I can't remember exactly, but you. Did you do keystroke logging, capturing the screen, and all that? Yeah, you did capturing the screen. You, um, oh, then maybe I don't need to do that. 
No, no, we do. Okay, yeah, you wanted to do it because I get a pretty good laugh for that. Yeah, and you snap from webcam, record from webcam. Okay, good. Okay, so they do have it on there. That's that's good to know. But I'm going to give you mine as well. Mine's different than theirs. Yeah, one of them didn't work, though. would be like, oh, if it had a webcam, this would work. Yeah, we don't have it. So yeah, like, you can't hold the command. But it was like, yeah, we don't have any webcams so hooked up to these. The thing so about mine is it sometimes works too well, which is to say there's no challenge. And right. Like, they have it set up so that you follow these steps, you will exploit that system. And that's just not the way it works. Well, the way my lab works is I have two of them. First one, step by step. It's close. The version's a little bit newer, so you gotta change a couple little things to learn how to do it. And then you gotta do it again on your own. With a little bit more challenge. A little bit, not too much different, but yeah, a little bit more. So it's not step by step the second time. Yeah. I like all the, the like the labs we're doing in digital forensics. Yeah. I like how they're set up most of the time. Yeah, and I, I yeah, so okay. Um, root kits. Root kits are kind of cool and they can do anything. Uh, I was actually playing with a rootkit, and I never believed this is even possible. You can go into rootkit and say, like, don't ever show the Windows record. And it literally would not appear anywhere. What happens is that Windows are crashed because it can't find itself. So it's like, but you can wow. go in and you can make a directory for, like, Lab 8, for instance. And you can tell it, do not ever show Lab 8 from any application. So if itself was installed in there, no one else could see it. So it's kind of a kind of cool. They're very malicious. Like I said they're they're dangerous. Okay. All right. Um, user awareness training, keeping current, same kind of stuff here. Inform users. Be suspicious of everybody. Verify who you're talking to. Call them back. Okay. Keeping current. Just doing our updates. We talked the same thing there. They talk about secure configurations. You can. Same thing in Windows, disable stuff. There's a lot of tools out there to do it. And that's the end of this chapter, okay? So that's the end of chapter eight. Any questions on chapter eight? Now, we don't have labs for all of these chapters. Is there one for this lab? Is there one for chapter eight? Does anyone know? Let's look here. Let's see if you guys got one for this. Yeah, there's a lab. There it is. Yeah. Okay, oh, there it is. MS, MBSA. Yeah, I saw that one. Okay, so. All right, so I think we're done, and I will see you all next week.